Yesterday when we left Miggery So, she had pretty much failed at every job that they had given her. She wasn't a good seamstress. She wasn't a good maid. She wasn't good helping in the kitchen. And so they basically told her that there's only one job left for her and that is to go down to the dungeon to bring Gregory the Jailer his meal every day. And she has to stay down there and wait for him to eat it and then bring the tray back up. But they said how scary and terrible and smelly the dungeon is and how humans were terrified of it. But Miggery So didn't seem to be scared. She went down the stairs smiling and laughing and just went about her day. And we also found out that the day before Miggery So had her first job bringing down the tray, Despero had been pushed down the stairs. So all the timelines of the three stories are starting to come together. And we'll see what happens down in the dungeon. Chapter 31, A Song in the Dark. The terrible foul odor of the dungeon did not bother Mig. That is perhaps sometimes because when Uncle was giving her a good clout to the ear, he missed his mark and delivered a good clout to Mig's nose instead. This happened often enough that it interrupted the proper workings of Mig's smelling senses, and so it was the overwhelming sense of despair and hopelessness and evil was not at all discernible to her, and she went down happily down the twisting and turning stairs. Hmm, maybe Mig is perfect for this job because she can't really smell anything. Gore, she shouted. It's dark, ain't it? Yes, it is, Mig, she answered herself. But if I was a princess, I would be so glittery light like that there wouldn't be a place in the world that was dark to me. At this point, Miggery so broke into a little song that went something like this. I ain't the princess P, but someday I will be. The P, ha ha, he he, someday I will be. Mig, as you can imagine, wasn't much of a singer. More of a bellower, really. But in her little song, there was too, to the rightly turned ear, a certain kind of music. And as Mig went singing down the stairs of the dungeon, there appeared from the shadows a rat wrapped in a cloak of red and wearing a spoon on his head. Who is it? Yes, yes, whispered the rat. A lovely song, just the song I've been waiting to hear. And Roscuro quietly fell in step behind, beside Miggery So. At the bottom of the stairs, Mig shouted out into the darkness, Gore, it's me, Miggery So. Most calls me Mig. Delivering your food. Come and get it, Mr. Deep Downs. There is no response. The dungeon was quiet, but it was not quiet in a good way. It was quiet in an ominous way. It was quiet in the way of small, frightening sounds. There was the snail-like slither of water oozing down the walls, and from around a darkened corner there came the low moan of someone in pain. And then, too, there was a noise of the rats going about their business, their sharp, t their sharp nails hitting the stones of the dungeon and their long tails dragging behind them through the blood and the muck. Reader, if you were standing in the dungeon, you would certainly hear all of these disturbing and ominous sounds. If I were standing in the dungeon, I would hear these sounds. If we were standing in the dungeon, we would hear the sounds and we would be very frightened. We would cling to each other in our fear. But what did Miggery so hear? That's right, absolutely nothing. Why couldn't Miggery so hear any of those scary sounds? And so she was not afraid at all, not in the least. She held the tray up higher, and the candle shed its weak light on the towering pile of spoons and bowls and kettles. Gore, said Mig, look at them things. I ain't never imagined there could be so many spoons in the whole wide world. There is more to this world than anyone could imagine, said a booming voice in the darkness. True, true, whispered Roscuro. The old jailer speaks the truth. Gore, said Mig, who said that? and she turned in the direction of the jailer's voice. Chapter 32, Beware of the Rats. The candlelight on Mig's tray revealed Gregory limping toward her, the thick rope tied around his ankle and his hands outstretched. You, Gregory, presumes have brought food for the jailer. Gore, said Mig, she took a step backward. Give it here, said Gregory, and he took the tray from Mig and sat down on an overturned kettle that had rolled free from the tower. He balanced the tray on his knees and sat at the covered plate. Gregory assumes that today again there is no soup. What? said Mig. Soup! shouted Gregory. Illegal! shouted Mig. Most foolish! muttered Gregory as he lifted the cover off his plate. Too foolish to be born a world without soup. He picked up a drumstick and put the whole thing in his mouth and chewed it and swallowed it. 
Here, said Meg, staring hard at him. You forgot the bones. Not forgotten. Chewed. Gore, said Meg, staring at Gregory with respect. You eats the bones? You are most ferocious. Gregory ate another piece of chicken, a wing, bones and all, and then another. Meg watched him admiringly. Some day, she said, and moved suddenly to tell this man her deepest wish. I will be a princess. At this moment, Chiroscuro, who was still at Meg's side, did a small, deliberate jig of joy. The light in his one candle, his dancing shadow, was large and fearful and fearsome indeed. Gregory sees you, Gregory said to the rat shadow. Roscuro stopped dancing. He moved to hide beneath Meg's skirt. Eh, shouted Meg, what's that? Nothing, shouted Gregory. So you aim to be a princess? Well, everyone has a foolish dream. Gregory, for instance, dreams of a world where soup is legal. And that a rat, Gregory is sure, and that rat, Gregory is sure, has some foolish dream too. If only you knew, whispered Roscuro. What, shouted Meg? Gregory said nothing more. Instead, he reached into his pocket, held his napkin up to his face, sneezed into it once, twice, three times. Bless you, shouted Meg. Bless you, bless you. Back to the world of light, Gregory whispered, and then he balled the napkin up and placed it on the tray. Gregory is done, he said, and he held the tray out to Meg. Done, are you? Then the tray goes back upstairs. Cook said it must. You take the tray to the deep downs, you wait for the old man to eat, and then you bring the tray back. That's my instructions. Did they instruct you two to beware of the rats? The what? The rats. What about them? Beware of them, shouted Gregory. Right, said Meg, beware the rats. Roscuro, hidden beneath Meg's skirt, rubbed his front paws together. Warn you all you like. Warn her all you like, old man, he whispered. My hour has arrived. The time is now and your rope must break. No nib -nib nibbling this time. Rather a serious chew that will break your rope in two. Yes, it is all coming clear. Revenge is at hand. Chapter 33, A Rat Who Knows Her Name. Meg had climbed the dungeon stairs and was preparing to open the door to the kitchen when the rat spoke to her. May I bother you for a second? Meg looked to her left and then to her right. Down here, Roscuro called. Meg looked at the floor. Gore, she said. You're a rat, ain't you? And didn't the old man just warn me of such? Beware the rats? She held the tray up higher so that the light from the candle shone directly on Roscuro and the golden spoon on his head and the blood red cloak around his neck. There's no need to panic, none at all, said Roscuro. As he talked, he reached behind his back using the handle. He raised the soup spoon off his head in much in the manner of a man lifting his hat to a lady. Gore, said Meg, a rat with manners? Yes, said Roscuro, how do you do? My papa had him a cloth much like yours, Mr. Rat, said Meg, red like that. He traded me for it. Ah, said Roscuro, and he smiled a large, knowing smile. Did he really? That is a terrible story, a tragic story. Reader, if you will pardon me for a second, we must pause to consider a great and unusual and pretentious thing. That great, unusual, pretentious thing is this. Roscuro's voice was pitched perfectly to make its way right through the torturous path of Meg's broken down cauliflower eared. That is to say, dear reader, that Miggery so heard perfect and true every single word the, the rat Roscuro uttered. You have known your fair share of tragedy, said Roscuro to Meg. Perhaps it's time for you to try to make the acquaintance of triumph and glory. Triumph, said Meg. Glory? Allow me to introduce myself, said Roscuro. I am Chiroscuro. Friends call me Roscuro, and your name is Migariso. And is it true, not, it is it not, that most people call you Mig? Ain't that the thing, shouted Mig, a rat who knows my name? So there is Roscuro with his wooden, or his spoon hat, talking to Migariso. And remember, Roscuro knows that this cloth is Migariso's dad's cloth, and he's not telling her that. He's not being very nice to her. He's kind of tricking her. We'll see what his plan is. Miss Miggery, my dear, I do not want to appear too forward so early in our acquaintance, but may I inquire, I am right in ascertaining that you have certain aspirations? What do you mean aspirations, shouted Mig. 
Miss Migri, there is no need to shout, none at all, as you can hear me so I can hear you. We are two perfectly suited for each other, said Roskiro. Aspirations, my dear, are those things that would make a servant girl wish to be a princess. Gore, agreed Meg, a princess is exactly what I want to be. There is, my dear, a way to make that happen. I believe there is a way to make that dream come true. You mean I could be the Princess P? Yes, your highness, said Roskiro, and he swept the spoon off his head and bowed deeply at the waist. Yes, your most royal Princess P. Gore, said Meg. May I tell you my plan? May I illustrate for you how we can make your dream of becoming a princess a reality? Yes, said Meg, yes. It begins, said Roskiro, with yours truly and the chewing of a rope. Mig held the tray with one small candle burning bright, and she listened to the rat as he went on, speaking directly to the deepest wishes inside her heart. So passionately did Roskiro speak, and so intently did the serving girl listen, that neither noticed as the napkin on the tray moved, nor did they notice the small mouse-like noises of disbelief and outrage that issued from the napkin as Roskiro went unfolding step by step his diabolical plan to bring the princess to the darkness. End of the third 